Good afternoon, and I encourage you to find a seat. We're going to start. And uh, on behalf of Mike Matlack and his family, I want to welcome you to the memorial service of Rose Marie Matlack. We especially want to welcome those who are watching online, possibly from all over the world. We're glad that you can watch this service wherever you might be, whatever tone, time zone you might find yourself in. My name is Aaron Culberson. I am the lead pastor here at Grace Community Bible Church, and it is an honor for our church to host you this afternoon. Mike and Rosemarie have been a part of this fellowship for over 10 years. They have both been a big blessing in this church, and as a church family, we hurt along with you at this time. You know, I remember when I first heard about Rosemarie, my heart sank, probably like most of you when you heard the news. You couldn't believe what you had heard. I do remember an email later from Mike when he was telling me about a conversation between him and Rose Marie. It went something like this. After one prayer time, I told Rose, I think I'm going to really, really miss you. Remember? <laughs> she promptly replied, I'm not going to miss you. <laughs> now, I remember reading that and I think, yes, that sounds like Rose Marie, that quick wit just right there. And there's a lot of truth to that statement. You know, since she is currently in a much better place than we are. She's in the presence of Jesus. But her absence here leaves us a void in our lives. And that's why this memorial service is so important. It's a time to remember the life and legacy of this woman. And that brings healing. Rosemary gave her life to Jesus. She loved him with everything that she had. And that love for Jesus left a big impression on everyone who knew her. And it's that relationship that we want to honor today. Because everything we knew about Rosemary, every part of the woman Rosemary was, is because of the work of Jesus in her life. You see, Rosemary had a personal relationship with Jesus that gave her hope at the end of this life. And when she and Mike received the news Three months ago that she had an aggressive, incurable cancer, her hope was in Jesus and that she would spend eternity with him. And because of her personal decision to place her faith in Jesus alone when she was 29 years old, last Wednesday evening, she went into the presence of Jesus. Rosemary will be missed. Mike, family, and friends, may God continue to fill you with his love and grace in the days ahead. May he minister to each one of you as you miss seeing her, as you miss being with her, your wife, your mother, your grandmother, your friend. And I'm confident that the Lord is faithful and he will continue to bless you and encourage you during these difficult days. You know, our purpose this afternoon is to remember and celebrate the life of Rosemary and to honor and glorify Jesus. We will laugh. We will cry. We will sing some great songs that Rose Marie loved. We will be hearing from a few family members share. We will read some of her favorite verses. And then we're going to see a slideshow of her life. But we'll be hearing a message that gave Rose Marie hope in this life. And I know will give each of us hope in a world full of brokenness and pain. So without going any further, let's just commit this time to the Lord. So if you bow your heads, let's just pray at this, at this time. Father, we thank you for um, this afternoon, uh, for this time to gather together for those who loved Rosemary, uh, for her family, uh, friends. We thank you that uh, you provided a way for us to have an eternal relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And it's that relationship that Rosemary had that we want to celebrate this afternoon. We thank you for um, uh, the hope that we can find through your son, Jesus, the hope we can have in the cross. And we may, as we go through this service, may everything that we do honor and glorify you. We, again, thank you that you can minister to our hearts during this time, and I pray that especially for her family, that you would just minister to their hearts, bring them healing and peace and comfort during this time. And again, may we all... Everything that we do this afternoon, honor and glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's his name we pray. Amen. And at this time, I think a couple of the granddaughters are going to come up. And Yes, they're there.
A reading from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked." Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. an obituary for Rosemary Margaret Matlack. Rosemary Matlack, age 74, passed away at home on Wednesday, October 21st, 2020, surrounded by her family. Rosemary is survived by her husband, Michael Matlack, her five children, Ann Smith, Elizabeth Talbot, Robert Matlack, Stephen Matlack, and David Matlack, her siblings, Thomas Von Hagel, Joseph Von Hagel, and her 17 grandchildren. She was preceded in death by her parents, Joanna and Rosemary, or Joseph and Rosemary Von Hagel, her brother David Von Hagel, and her sister Joanna Kimmins. Rosemary was born on April 9, 1946, in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Joseph and Rosemary Von Hagel. She graduated from Our Lady of Angels High School in 1964. She married Michael Matlack on January 18, 1969. Rosemary and Michael's marriage of 51 years saw them live in Virginia, Maryland, and Minnesota during the first years of their marriage. Eventually, they settled in Salt Lake City in 1977, where they remained until the present. During her years in Salt Lake City, Rosemary was actively involved in a number of churches, including the Evangelical Free Church of Salt Lake City, the Chinese Christian Church, and the Grace Community Bible Church. Rosemary was a founding board member of the Intermountain Christian School in Salt Lake City. Rosemary was passionate about her faith in Jesus and was a devout student of the Bible. She loved to share her passion with women throughout the Salt Lake Valley during her nearly 10 years as the woman, women's teaching leader with Bible study fellowship as well as through many church Sunday school and Bible study programs. In her later years, she traveled numerous times overseas to Kenya where she ministered alongside her husband Michael at Kajabi Children's Center. She would spend hours talking and praying with the patients and their families in their time of medical crisis. Rosemary's greatest legacy is the large number of people who came to learn more about the transforming love of Jesus Christ through Rose's day in, day out, faithful life and witness. She spent her days praying for and encouraging her husband, her children, her grandchildren, and countless others as she sought to bring others closer to Jesus. She was diagnosed with aggressive and incurable cancer in August of 2020. She died in the full confidence of knowing that she will spend eternity in the loving presence of God, not because of anything she had done in this life, but because of the saving love of Jesus given freely to all in his death and his resurrection. She was a sinner saved by God's grace, a humble and dedicated servant of God, a faithful wife, mother, grandmother, sister, daughter, and friend.
During our time together, we're going to be singing some songs that Rosemary, I'm assuming, picked out or ones that she really liked. So I'm up here going to lead us. This is not what I do. So I really need a lot of help and support from you. So I think it's better if we stand and sing because it just sounds better. So if you stand with me, the first song we're going to sing is Rock of Ages. of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the waters and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin a double cure save from wrath and make me pure not the going to come up and share from a few scriptures. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpets of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus... We shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is Romans 8, verse 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that was obviously not Rob. Uh, that was Julie and Rachel, a couple of granddaughters. But at this time, we're going to sing the song, Man of Sorrows, or another way to look at it is Hallelujah, What a Savior. And since you sang so well last time, you can stay seated. How about that? <laughs> I was hoping the music wasn't continued because you don't want to hear me sing. <clears throat> so when my daughter, Rachel, was five years old, uh, she needed heart surgery. So of course, Rosemary uh, flew across the country to be with us during that significant event. How many times do you think Rose flew on an airplane to be a part of a significant event? Uh, Rachel was, Rose was with us at the hospital as the doctors were preparing Rachel for surgery. And in the in-between times, to keep Rachel's mind off the surgery, we brought, we brought the game Uno. And so the first few games, you know, we're giving Rachel a little bit of help, and, and she would win those games. And, you know, I'm pretty distracted, worried about my daughter who's about to go into heart surgery. And I, um, you know, game three, all of a sudden I look over and I notice that Rachel has all the cards, right? And I hear her in her cute little five-year-old voice say, Grandma, do I really need to draw four? And Grandma says, yes, sweetheart, as she grabs the, you know, four cards off the deck and hands them to Rachel. And, and I look at Rose. I'm like, Rose, what are we, what are we doing, <laughs> you know? And she's like, 
it's really good for people to know how to lose. <laughs> so I share that story with you for two reasons. One, because it's the only fault I knew in the life of Rose. And two, because it explains why I'm up here. See, when I was 21 years old, I made a comment to Rose that I, I will never speak in public. And I think Rose got a little smirk on her face, and she said, yeah, I'm going to have you speak at my funeral, right? <laughs> you know, honestly, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share some thoughts about Rose. I'm thankful for the time I've had to just process and think and remember, you know, trying to put to words um, a life that was as full as Rose's is overwhelming. You know, even just looking around today, some know her as sister, as wife, as mom, as grandma, as friend. Rose shared her life with all of you in a unique and special way. And I realized at some point, all I can really do is share with you my perspective um, on Rose's life. You know, I first met Rose uh, in May of 1992 when I flew to Utah uh, with Anne. This was my meet the parents moment. And I recognized Rose immediately. I thought she looked just like Ann. She greeted me with a warm and friendly hug. And I was spoiled that week with food and fun. I didn't wash a dish. I didn't pick up a plate. And really, it, 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 the epitome of it was after three days of camping, right, with, with her brother and some other friends, we come back and we're dirty and smelly and the car is, is stinky and all the camping equipment is, you know, half used, and Rose greets us at the door, <clears throat> um, right, says, boy, you guys really look like you could use a shower. Go ahead, Rick, take a shower and just go rest, right? I'll have Steve and Dave clean up everything for you. <clears throat> and in that moment, I knew, right, that this was a family I just needed to be a part of. <clears throat> and, and for a while, right, I thought it was me, right, my kind heart and gentle nature, my love for her daughter, must have won her affection, and I was uniquely being rewarded. But I, now, I realize this is not true, as we entered into a season of weddings and kids. And now this was not an easy season for me. As I learned, I had to share Rose with other people who were marrying into the family. And, and, and then there were all these grandkids. Is it possible to continue to feel special when the family expands to 29 and 17 of them are grandkids, right? Somehow, somehow Rose made this possible. I was talking to Katie the other day, my daughter Katie, and I asking her about grandma, and she started saying things like, grandma had something special for everyone. I checked this out. I wasn't sure. I thought it was just me. I checked, so I checked it out the other day with, with um, others, and I realized it's true. Banana bread for Caleb, French toast for Josiah, Jojo bars for Julia, waffles for Natalie, right? Lots of people loved her cinnamon rolls, chocolate cake, and chocolate chip cookies. She attended classes with some and had tea parties with others and even played with pets she didn't like just to make people feel special. And I could go on, but I think you get the picture. Grandma had a unique way of making everyone feel like a favorite. Rose was a gift. Rose was a gift. A gift to everyone who knew her. That goes way beyond family. Everyone who came to visit her, everyone who heard her teach, everyone who went on a walk with her, everyone who shared a meal or a conversation or a laugh, Rose was a gift. And as I thought about this more, and I started asking other people, like, how was Rose a gift? Three ideas continued to come to the surface. Rose was a gift because she served generously. Uh, shortly after Ann and I were married, we had the opportunity to visit her family in, in Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. And um, <clears throat> this house, I don't know if you've ever been to rural Kentucky, but it is rural. Like, there are not a lot of houses around there, especially where her brother Tom lived. But I remember being squeezed into this house, sitting on the edge, edge of a couch, hardly being able to fit because there were so many people in the room. And, and all of these people were there, right? It felt like all of northern Kentucky was there to see Rose, right? Their sister had come back. Uh, their aunt was in the house, and so many people had come to visit. And all of these people who were there to see Rose, 
<clears throat> but I didn't see Rose, <laughs> right? And then I see her come out of the kitchen carrying a plate of something, right? Serving the people who were there to see her. She loved to serve. I was thinking about, I was trying to think of a story that would, you know, where everybody, like kind of all the grandkids, all of us were involved. And there wasn't just a single story that came to mind, but there was just this regular pattern that continued to, to happen. <clears throat> Your grandma would move heaven and earth to make it possible for us all to be together at the same time. And that wasn't easy because we are a family that's very spread out. <clears throat> um, she would welcome each of us. She would have a room ready and prepared for us. Uh, and then she would wake up in the middle of the night to pray for us. I'm not sure Grandma Rosie ever slept through the night. <clears throat> She'd have breakfast ready from 7 to 11, depending on when you woke up. She'd typically be back in bed after breakfast for an hour, and then off to the store to prepare something amazing for dinner. I think her favorite thing was a house full of people who were laughing and talking together. And I know that Rose did not only serve her family. She served as a BSF teaching leader, a small group leader, a Sunday school teacher. She co-wrote a Bible study on the book of Hebrews. She served all over the world. A friend who served with Mike and Rose in Kenya uh, wrote to Mike recently, and he said this, while we surgeons are proud of our cutting and sewing, I am convinced that Rose had a deeper impact on the people of Kajabi than either Mike or I. Rose's impact was not only on the mothers with sick children, but also on all the workers as well, both long-termers and short-termers. Her praying with the moms on the wards not only cared for them, but helped all of us remember the deeper purposes of our presence. Rose served generously. But Rose was also a gift because she made everyone feel valuable. I think Rose had a unique way of making everyone just feel better about themselves. She made people feel valuable by loving people well. And the people who experienced her love most were her five children. Her five children. Now I want to just speak to you for a few moments. Your mom loved you so much. Now, I know that our value as people comes from knowing that we are created by God and made in his image. This is true, right? And the way that God communicates this truth to us is ideally first through mom and dad. And from my perspective, right, no one communicated value to their children better than Rose. If you think about how Rose spent her time and energy over the last 30 years that I've known her, <clears throat> you will quickly see that you five are at the center. You are at the center of her decision process. She loved you, and therefore she loved the things that you loved. And because words didn't, don't communicate love and value as tangibly as gifts, she gave lots of gifts. You remember when, I don't know if you remember, but when Katie was uh, was. was had her first Christmas, uh, Mike and Rose went a bit crazy, and they bought all kinds of gifts, right? And we brought them all into the living room, and you could hardly find a place to sit, right? There were so many gifts that she got tired of opening them, if you can imagine such a thing. And I think that's a good picture of how Rose loved her children. It was abundant. It was unnecessary. And from the perspective of others, it was too much. But it was Rose. How many times did Rose return a compliment on something she was wearing with, you like it? I was thinking of you when I bought it. Go ahead and take it. Rose knew no limits to the size of her gifts as she would often take you shopping, take you on vacation, and even give you the car out of the garage. <clears throat> and the greatest gift uh, she gave did not cost money. She gave the gift of her time and her presence. She was always, always among the first to see your kids when each one was brought home. She taught you how to give them a bath and how to place them in a crib. She spent countless hours praying for you and your children. Uh, Mike said just the other day that her long hours of prayer, and we all know Rose loved to pray, 
It was not for herself and her needs. Her prayers were for you and for the people you love. It's your mom. And Rose didn't do this. Rose didn't do this because it's fun to change diapers, fly on airplanes, and spend money. No, she did it because you, right, the five of you, are the most valuable people in her world, the people she cares about most. And in every gift, she was saying, I love you, and you're valuable, and don't forget it. Don't forget it. Rose was a gift. Another reason Rose was a gift is because she loved and lived grace. Loved and lived grace. The greatest gift that Rose offered to everyone who is in this room and all the others who may be watching is the gift of a better understanding of Jesus and grace. Rose's testimony, and I've shared it lots of times, it begins with an actual picture of Jesus that hung on her childhood, hung in her childhood home. And it was a picture of Jesus where he was depicted as condemning, uh, demanding, and stern. And this picture haunted Rose because she was aware of her sin and aware of her inability to be good enough. And to please God by performance is impossible. And then she was introduced to grace to grace, a free gift purchased by the blood of Jesus. And in a moment, she realized that she did not have to earn God's love. She just had to receive his love. It's a gift. And in faith, she did. And her life was transformed, and her real legacy began. This, this, more than anything else, became her life's work. The only times I saw Rose upset, really, the only time I saw her really upset was when she became concerned that grace was being traded or diminished by anything else, right? If a theological system or a religious practice bounced up against grace, Rose would not stop until she was sure grace was understood and it remained at the center. Rose loved to study everything about God, but this one idea transformed her life more than any other, and she wanted the world to know it, and she defended it fiercely. Rose's legacy is not in the physical birth of children, but in the spiritual birth of people. When Rose made the decision to follow Jesus, an evangelist was born, right, from her husband, to her birth family in Cincinnati, to Mike's birth family, to their children and grandchildren, all were impacted by Rose's relationship with Jesus. And who knows, who knows how many others from her teaching at BSF, Sunday school, missionary hospitals in Kenya, neighborhood walks, and countless other places all over the world. You know, Pastor Aaron, and I, I know you were scheduled to share the gospel as part of this service, and I apologize. (laughs) I have no idea how I could talk about Rose without talking about the gospel. It's who she was. It's how she lived. It, It was baked into most conversations. It woke her up in the middle of the night. It led her to be a prayer warrior for every one of us. Rose lived out the gospel message, and this is the greatest gift the greatest gift that she has given to us all. <clears throat> in, the, in the final days of her life, you know, Rose became very weak, and, and it was very difficult for her to, to talk with any volume at all. But she breathed this to Mike, one of the last things that she said, and she just looked into Mike's eyes, right? And she said, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And those words... I think capture who Rose really is. It's all about Jesus. And Mike, you know better than any of us what a gift Rose was to the world. And if we gave you the microphone today, we'd be here until Friday. (laughs) So many stories, so many things you could say about your beloved. No one will miss her more than you. You had a front row seat to her life. And Mike, we all know that she didn't do it alone. Rose needed someone, 
right? God knew she needed someone, and God gave her you, <laughs> you, to love her and adore her till the day she went to be with Jesus. For over 50 years, you walked by her side, and you literally handed her off to the only one who, have, who could have loved her better, her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. From all of us who love Rose, thank you for loving her well and to the very, very end. Rose loved the book of Hebrews. And so in the form of chapter 11, right, which talks about people of amazing faith, in the form of that, uh, let me end with this. By faith, Rose accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior. By faith, she loved her husband and served alongside him for 51 years. By faith, she generously and abundantly communicated value and love to her children, their spouses, her grandchildren, and her friends by giving generously of her time and attention whenever it was needed. By faith, Rose used her talents to communicate the grace and love of God in words and deed to anyone who would listen. Well done, Rose. Now, and enjoy.
I kind of remember this. Just sit, just sit yeah. and you'll float. I know I will. Oh, it's we'll not floating. too cold. There you go. When any performance-based law keeping is added, the gospel is changed into a system of what I am doing so that God will think I am a good person and he will accept me. That's what the law says. Look at what I'm doing, God. I'm pleasing you. I'm doing a good job. But grace is just the opposite. We are looking not at what we do, but what Jesus Christ has done for us. in the back all cleaned up. We'll get it under your neck. And then you know what we're going to do, Zoe? We're going to dry your head so you're not so cold. And we'll put your little hat back on. Yeah. That will feel so good. Yeah, Mom's got the towel. She's going to dry you. What a great video. And Rick, we cannot get enough of the gospel, right? Yes. Um, you know, memorial services are going to take place all over the world today. Hundreds, if not thousands of them. But there's one common thread of similarity that will run through each one. No matter who the person is, no matter where they come from, no matter their religious background, there will be one word that is a theme to all the services and the word is consider. Consider. Consider means to think about carefully, to regard highly, and to reflect on. And doesn't that accurately describe what we've done this afternoon? So I want to continue on with that theme, and I want to briefly consider three things. In this service, it was our desire to think about and to hold in high regard the life of Rosemary Matlack. And we have done that. We have gathered together to remember and celebrate her life, not just here in person, but all over the world. I, I just want to mention a couple of things about Rose Marie. Now, Rick shared some great things about her encompassing her life, and I did not know her as well as most people in this room, but there are a couple of things that stood out to me, and after hearing Rick speak, it really reinforced of what I noticed in Rose Marie. First is she was faithful. She was faithful. She was faithful to Jesus. She was faithful to Mike. 
She was faithful to her five children, and she was faithful to their spouses. She was faithful to her 17 grandchildren. She was faithful to her friends. She was faithful to this church. You know, when I stepped into the role as a lead pastor just over a year ago, they didn't stop coming because the founding pastor was gone, or they didn't stop coming because I was a new guy in this position, but instead, they encouraged me whenever they could whether it was in person or, once COVID hit, through email. When I received encouragement from Rose Marie, I can't tell you how much that meant to me. And when I, Mike, Mike asked me to proceed over this memorial service, I was very, very honored because I know there's many, many people in your life that could do this. So I'm very honored to stand up here before you. So Rose Marie was very faithful. The second thing is she also loved people. She loved people. She loved sharing about her hope in Jesus with all kinds of people, with ladies all across this valley. She loved her time in Kenya, spending her entire days with people who were so desperate to hear about hope. She loved encouraging women to live out their faith. She loved her family. And that's just a tip of the people she influenced Like Rick mentioned, who knows how many people she influenced. But the overall theme of her life is she loved people. We've had a great time remembering Rosemary this afternoon, thinking about her, reflecting on her life. But I also want to consider two other things. And the first is ourselves. I want each of you to think about yourself. Julia read from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I'm going to read it again. It says, brothers and sisters... We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Here in this letter to this church, Paul doesn't say do not grieve, but instead he says do not grieve like those who have no hope. In other words, grieve with hope. Grief and hope, sorrow and joy. Grief, but not hopeless. Sorrow, but not despairing. All of you here and listening have grieved the loss of Rosemary in some way. You've been thinking constantly of Mike and the Matlack family during this time. And that's why we are present here today. We love Rosemary. We love Mike. And we love the Matlack family. But here's a reality that each one of us face and that is death. When Rosemary and Mike got the news that she has a very aggressive, incurable form of cancer, they realized at that moment that death was near. Many of us here today will not experience the quick, aggressive nature of death that Rosemary experienced, but we will all face the battle of death in our lives. So when we come to memorial services like this, it's natural to start thinking about our own life. We start asking questions like, how much more time do I have? What will happen to me after this life is done? What kind of hope do I have? Or where do I place my hope? If you're here and listening, it's probably made you to pause and think about your own life. It made you consider yourself. How would I personally react if I had to face this battle that Rose fought? Would I have hope beyond the grave? Would I be able to grieve with hope? And here's the reality. If our hope after this life is found in anything besides Jesus and in ourselves, we will be left hopeless because none of us is good enough. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's a standard that God expects. It's the glory of God. Perfection. And we all fall short of that mark. Rose Marie fell short of that mark. So our hope cannot be in anything in ourselves, or even someone else, or even this world around us, because no one is good except God alone. And the question is, do you believe that? 
Again, we will all face the end of our life. Where's our hope found? And if you're having a hard time answering that question, maybe it's a question that you're not even sure how to answer, then listen. If there's one thing that I think Rose Marie would say to you right now is consider Christ. Think carefully about Christ. Jesus came down to this earth. He put on flesh. He gave his life on a cross. And when we place our faith in Jesus alone, in his death alone, we have eternal life through him. It is a gift of God, like Rick said. And it's only by the grace of God. 1 John 5.11 says, And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. We're told that God has given eternal life. He wants to spend eternity with you and I. But we're told where that life is found. In verse 11 it says, That life is in his Son. That life is in Jesus. And then John goes on to say in 1 John to stress there are two sides of the fence we can fall on. There's only two sides. He says, He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. If you have the Son, if you've placed your faith in Jesus like Rosemary has, according to the words here in 1 John, you have life. But if you haven't, if you haven't considered Christ, John makes it clear, God makes it clear, you do not have life. You do not have life beyond this grave. And then John explains why he wrote these words. It's the confidence, the hope. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It's so that we know with confidence, without a doubt, that we have eternal life. That's how Rosemary lived her life. No doubt in her mind. Her hope is in Jesus. She was going to spend eternity with Jesus when she got the news of that cancer. We can have hope in our grieving. And that's we can have hope when we face death. Rose placed her faith in Jesus alone. She had the son. And because of that, she knew she would have eternal life in the presence of Jesus when her body stopped working. And if you're here this afternoon, maybe you're listening online, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've never considered Christ, I can guarantee you Rosemary be saying, trust in him today. Put your faith in Jesus today because you may not have a tomorrow. Simply, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in a minute, just simply acknowledging that, you know what? I am a sinner. I've messed up. And I fall short of God's glory. I fall short of his perfection. But thank the Lord that he sent his son down to this earth to give his life on a cross. And according to the words of 1 John, when we place our faith in Jesus, we have life. So the question is, do I have the Son? That's a question you personally have to ask. And I want you to give that to the Lord as we close this time and pray. And pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, this afternoon, again, for this time that we can just focus on the life of Rosemary. And we thank you for, again, for uh, the work you did in her life and that she was willing to do the work. She was willing to step out and be an instrument of righteousness for you, to lead and encourage and exhort others, to get people to consider Christ in their life. I continue to lift up the family in prayer that, again, you will continue to minister to them in the coming days. Again, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross that gives us hope beyond the grave. Thank you for your love. And we just, again, thank you for the time that we can just celebrate this life of Rose. And we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. 
But I'm going to ask you to stand now since you haven't stood in a, a while. It's called, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I've been wondering how Rose and I could thank you. So about two and a half or three weeks ago, Rose is very weakened. She can only whisper. And it's hard to hear the words that she's saying. When I walked in the room, she had the most content smile on her face that I'd ever seen in my life. She couldn't have a full smile anymore because she was too weak. But she had full contentment on her face. And I said, "Hun, what are you thinking? And she said, Michael, I have never felt more loved in my entire life. Loved by my family and loved by my friends. So that outpouring of love that we've shared today, that you have shared with us as we've gone through this hard period of time of dying, brought full contentment to the one that you and I love. That's Rosemary's thank you to you. And I just echo the same emotions. So thank you. Stand with me. Let's uh, close our time in prayer. Father, we thank you for, um, again, this time. We thank you for this service. We thank you for Jesus. Uh, and again, I ask your blessing upon Mike. Continue to comfort him during these days ahead. 
be with the family, that you would just minister to them in a special way that only you can. Again, we thank you for the life of Rosemary, Rosemary, and we just thank you for just the work that Jesus can do in each of our lives. And I pray that that would just motivate each one of us to go from this place and live for you and live like Rosemary did. And we, again, we just thank you for this service. And uh, again, we just lift up the name of Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen.